Welcome to History Valley Podcast. Today I'm live with Professor Dennis McDonald. And today he's going to be talking about how he uses the book of Deuteronomy to reconstruct the Q document. Welcome back to History Valley Podcast, Professor McDonald. Thank you, Jacob. So tell us, how, how do you use the book of Deuteronomy to reconstruct the Q document to solve the synoptic problem? Well, I don't really use the book of Deuteronomy to reconstruct it. I okay. use it to interpret what otherwise can be established in the Q document. And if I might, I'd like to give a brief overview of the history of the discovery of Q, where it stands, you know, where the synoptic problem stands today, and why my solution, the Q plus Papias hypothesis, is, in my view, a serious advance on that. Mm. And using new methodology, I create a longer queue than is usually uh, the case. And when I reconstruct it, when I reconstructed it, it occurred to me that this is extensively an imitation of Deuteronomy to pr uh, present Jesus as the uh, prophet like Moses, but one who's more compassionate. And in fact, the Q document is not really a Christian document. It's a, a document written by a Jewish intellectual who thought Jesus was great. And then Christian authors uh, jumped on it and uh, mythologized Jesus somewhat uh, further by using Greek categories. But the original text, apparently, of the Q document uh, was an imitation of the last book of the Pentateuch. Um, the Q hypothesis relies on several um, presumptions, uh, some of which are almost certainly correct. One is marking priority among the synoptic gospels. The synoptics are Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Matthew and Luke independently redacted or edited the uh, Markan account. But in addition, they have much more content in many cases, overlapping content, such that um, it's possible that they got these this material independently from a lost gospel that we call Q from the German word Kavella, meaning a source, or like a spring of water. Uh, the problem with reconstructing Q as it's been done in the past is it makes two assumptions. One is when one eliminates um, Mark and influence on Matthew and Luke, one would think that there are, is no uh, overlap then between Q and Mark because of the, the, that process. But the contrary is the case. We have doublets in both Matthew and Luke that indicate that Mark has the same material that appear independently in Matthew and Luke. So that doesn't seem to work. So one uh, alternative to the two-document hypothesis is the modified two-document hypothesis. It argues that, yes, Matthew and Luke um, independently used the Q document, but that Mark knew it as well. So that, it, to some extent, Mark needs to be considered a third witness to it. The other problem that we have with the two-document hypothesis, however, and it's the one that gets latched on by advocates of the uh, mark and priority without Q or the far hypothesis, scholars like, uh, advocated by uh, scholars like Mark Goodacre, is that um, Luke almost certainly knew Matthew. And the arguments for this are overlapping content in the passion narrative, in the infancy narratives, and really hundreds, some would argue thousands, of what are so-called minor agreements, places where Luke agrees with Matthew's alterations of Mark. And some of these so-called minor agreements are not so minor. So scholars right now in the field of New Testament scholarship, gospel scholarship, are in a pitched battle between those who argue for a reconstruction of Q according to the two-document hypothesis that argues that Luke did not know 
And the FAR hypothesis people who insist, and I think rightly, that Luke knew Matthew, and therefore one doesn't need a lost gospel in order to account for the overlaps. But that is way too simple, because even if one goes there, Luke, in many cases, many cases, has content that's more primitive than what you'd find in Matthew. So if one, if you have a common um, connection between, if you have a connection between these two documents, in many cases, Luke's got to be first. Well, that's not going to happen. I mean, we know that Luke is probably uh, a late first century, or more likely an early second century document. So the Q plus Hypius hypothesis, um, in its simplest form, in its concern to reconstruct the Q document focuses first on what is called reversed priority of Matthew to Mark. That is, we know that Matthew redacts Mark. But in many cases, Matthew had, in about 21 cases, Matthew has doublets to Mark. That is, he, he redacts Mark, he has that content, and then he repeats it someplace else and every time that he repeats it someplace else, it's in a more primitive form. Uh, Luke has the same phenomenon. He knows Mark and Matthew, but in about 21 cases, he has doublets that are earlier than what we had found in his sources. Now, this requires criteria to determine which is more prior when you have parallel accounts. And I'll go back and say more about doublets and non-doublets in a moment. But these criteria are really quite simple. When one finds in these two uh, examples of a saying that one is independent and one has been absorbed or expanded into a narrative, the one that's individual is more likely the original. And this is because in ancient rhetoric, people were told how to transform maxims into crei, that is, narratives that contextualize a saying. The second criterion is uh, difficulties um, are earlier than improvements. Usually, when someone redacts a document, they try to solve the problems instead of create them. The third is typicalities are almost always secondary to atypicalities. And what that means is, if one finds uh, um, two sayings that are similar to each other, but one has telltale characteristics of the author, um, let's say Matthew, and the other does not, the one without those typicalities usually is uh, from a source. Now, this becomes all very arcane. And it's really arcane when one gets it to the issue of non-doublets or avoided doublets. And all that means is, let's say Matthew is redacting Mark for a, a long series and then stops doing so. But the same saying that he should have redacted from Mark appears elsewhere in Matthew and with more primitive wording. Now, how does that happen? Now, some scholars would say that just shows that you have a vibrant oral tradition uh, and Mark and Matthew both know the tradition and Matthew preserves the more original version of it. Well, that is really very highly unlikely. I need to turn my phone off. I'm sorry. Um, no problem. So, so that's what the, uh, the, the two document hypothesis uh, problem is and how the Q plus Papius hypothesis attempts to resolve it. Now, do you, I want to just, I'm going to let you ask some questions, but I want to tell you how this works for Deuteronomy. Once one collects these materials uh, where you have reversed priority of Matthew to Mark and Luke to Mark and Matthew, one has a significant body of logia, or sayings, or pericope. And these can be collected and analyzed for their uh, common characteristics. Some of them are going to be literary. Some of them are going to be social identity issues, where the, um, in 
when you have these differences, some scholars would say it just shows that Jesus is coming from uh, Palestine before the Jewish war and these materials reflect himself. Um, others would say, no, I would say that they reflect a different document. But what makes the case for a different document is when you look at these materials, even before assembling them into a coherent book, one finds over and over and over again imitations of Deuteronomy. Now, at the end of Deuteronomy, one reads that we, there still has not been the promised prophet like Moses who can perform these miracles such as Moses did in Egypt. Um, and the Q document is placing Jesus in that role as the promised prophet like Moses, who can, in fact, do these miracles. And, but he also is a different kind of lawgiver. He's one who is substituting the principle of holiness with one of compassion. And the way the law gets applied, Jewish law gets applied by the, uh, the, the lost gospel is very different from the way that Pharisees are um, said to have applied these laws. And um, when, when it's appropriate, I'm going to read... Um, a summary of my reconstruction of the Q document to show you. Uh, I'll just highlight the uh, the parallels to Deuteronomy, and I think it'll be fun for you and your uh, audit and your viewers. Yeah, I agree. That would be fun. Um, what, can, can you give the audience some examples of the doublets that you're talking about? Uh, sure, there are lots of them. Um, one is that uh, Matthew has Jesus say twice that um, one should not divorce, that divorce is uh, prohibited. Mark has one example of that, um, and so Matthew gets one of his examples from that. But he has another one that shows more primitive um, uh, wording, and uh, that one's in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount largely comes from the Q document. So um, Luke has it only once, but he's not taking it from Mark. He's taking it from a document, and his version is even earlier. So that's a good example of um, reversed priority. Uh, Luke is, at la is last, but he has the most primitive version of it. Um, there are many other examples. I mean, I, I told you there are about 20, uh, more than 20 of them, both for uh, uh, Matthew and Luke, and they sometimes have doublets of the same, uh, the same saying because they're getting it from the same document. So these doublets and non-doublets are like um, basically similar sayings but one is like longer than the other in that so in that sense that's how you can tell one is more primitive than the other I, is that correct uh, no it's the three uh, length is not usually a good marker although sometimes okay. it, a, a shorter one can be better because the longer one is an elaboration but we find examples of truncation as well so the three criteria again are um one a saying that's independent and together with other sayings is usually more primitive than a saying that's embedded into a narrative because narratives um, like crayi um, pick up maxims and give it a context to, where Jesus is speaking to, uh, directly to the Pharisees, whereas one version, more likely an earlier one, is uh, in, independent. Another is if one saying um, has difficulties and the other one does not have those difficulties and is explaining the problem in the earlier one, the one that's an improvement is usually later. So you take the one that's got more problems. The third is if you have two of them, uh, two sayings and you're comparing them and one of them, um, Matthew talks about uh, the, the father who's in heaven um, or changes the son of man to I, it's almost certainly a typicality 
uh, characteristic of Matthew. So the other version most likely is earlier. And you see this a lot in uh, Luke in preserving the son of man language in places where Matthew um, has clarified that it's Jesus himself. So those are the criteria that I think are most useful. Now in the <laughs> In the work that took me 25 years to do, um, you have to sift these things very carefully, and these um, rubrics need to be further um, clarified and uh, perfected. But I think, um, in my experience, people almost never have challenged uh, my assessment that one is earlier than the other. Um, the issue is how to explain of the doublets. Is it oral tradition? Is it multiple sources? Or is it a single coherent document? And that's why the, the thesis about Deuteronomy is so important. Could you tell us, um, hold, hold on a second, we got a super chat now. Um, awesome. Uh, Matt, awesome. Thank you for the $5. Professor McDonald, how do you think G. Thomas fits in? Could it be an evolution of Q? Keep up the great work, Jacob. Thank you. Um, well, the Gospel of Thomas is really quite fascinating. But what we know now is that the Gospel of Thomas knows uh, some of the canonical Gospels. And um, it has its own ideology that explains much of it, the selection of sayings, the addition of sayings, and so on. Uh, I, my dissertation actually dealt with the saying that appears in the Gospel of Thomas that has parallels in the Pauline epistles and almost certainly is independent. So the Gospel of Thomas is a reservoir, potentially, of traditional sayings some of which have parallels to Q or the, the Gospels, but that doesn't mean Q is independent of the Gospels. So here again, one has to do it case by case. So we have three um, issues in response to uh, awesome math, uh, math, some math, uh, awesome <laughs> question. It's um, awesome, Matt. We have some, we have some early uh, independent tradition. We have some in traditions in Thomas that overlap with what we find in the Gospels um, and may be more primitive in version. In that case, it, it would be interesting to compare them to Q. In many cases, though, we find uh, Thomas um, using the synoptics. So one has to deal with this on a case-by-case -case basis. Could you, um, could you now tell us uh, how, you, how the book of Deuteronomy assisted you in reconstructing the Q document and making it longer? Um, again, it has to do mostly not with the identification of the various units, but it helps in the um, organization of them into a coherent text. And uh, Jacob, if I have permission, I'm going to read my reconstruction of this now. Um, you're welcome to uh, interrupt it along the way. But um, I think your auditors and your viewers are going to enjoy listening to these gospel stories in the context of Deuteronomy, and you'll hear them really in a very different way, I think. So uh, do I have your permission to do that? Of course, go right ahead. Okay. The author of Logoi, or um, the Q document, the author's dominating literary project was a polemical rewriting of the final book of the Pentateuch, to portray Jesus as the promised prophet like Moses, whom the author names four times. Nine times he explicitly cites the Torah, six of which are from Deuteronomy. More often, he cites or alludes to these books to rival them, 13 times, 10 from Deuteronomy. Furthermore, my reconstruction of the lost gospel often agrees with the literary arrangement of Deuteronomy as the following survey will expose. 
the title, the Logoi, or words of Jesus, in the first five verses, prepare the reader to compare Jesus to Moses as depicted in the opening verse of Deuteronomy. These are the Logoi that Moses spoke to all of Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. John, preaching in the wilderness, immediately predicts that, quote, the one to come will be stronger than he, and thus better able to fulfill the promise that God would raise up someone like Moses who would perform signs and wonders, great marvels. Jesus first appears in Judea, where God's Spirit depends, descends upon him, as it had on Ezekiel, the rejected prophet. Jesus then hears from a heavenly voice that he is not merely a son of man like Ezekiel, but the son of God. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus fasts for 40 days in the wilderness where the devil tests him, an echo of Israel's 40 years of testing in the desert and Moses' fasting on Mount Sinai for 40 days in Deuteronomy. In each of his three attemptations, Jesus cites Deuteronomy, the devil surveying all the kingdoms of the world atop a mountain invokes God showing Moses the expanse of the promised land atop Mount Nebo in Deuteronomy 34. When Jesus calls a few men to follow him, he does not advertise his identity as the Son of God. Rather, he states that he is the Son of Man who has nowhere to lay his head. The reference to Jesus as the Son of Man here, and again 13 times later in the work, is the first use of the title for him in any Christian text. The author of the Lost Gospel apparently invented it to create dramatic irony. Readers know that Jesus has become the Son of God at his baptism, and thus is superior even to Moses. But he rejected his status in his temptations and identified rather with the rejected Ezekiel. The creation of the title Son of Man in Logoi is one of its most significant contributions to Christian theology. In the four controversies that follow, Jesus bends Mosaic law to diminish the harm inflicted by hard-nosed enforcement of it on those marginal in Jewish Galilee. These include tax collectors, sexual sinners, the hungry, and the physically disabled. These disputes set the stage for his alternative commandments in the inaugural sermon, which he delivers to 12 men upon a mountain, evoking Moses' selecting a man from each of the 12 tribes to ascend a mountain to receive the law in Deuteronomy. In his inaugural sermon, Jesus explicitly contrasts his teaching with Jewish scriptures. Quote, and this is very important, Jacob. The law and the prophets were in force until John. From then on, the kingdom of God is in force. The teachings that follow frequently challenge Mosaic commandments. The divine attribute most important to emulate no longer is holiness, as in Leviticus, but compassion. For this reason, one must avoid judging others and live by the golden rule, a positive inversion of the law of reciprocal retribution, a lex talionis, as in Deuteronomy 9, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Moses' final words in Deuteronomy list blessings for those who obey God's commandments and curses for those who do not. Similarly, Jesus concludes his inaugural sermon by likening those who observe his sayings to a person who builds a house on bedrock, and those who do not uh, observe them resemble a person who builds his house on sand and cannot survive a flood. The curing of the centurion's son spectacularly transforms Moses' final speech to Israel. Immediately after catalog, a catalog of blessings and curses in Deuteronomy 30, Moses orders that when the 12 tribes enter the promised land, they must replicate their victories over the Amorite kings Sihon and Og. Namely, they must kill hostile kings together with their wives and children. But immediately after no Jesus' inaugural sermon and its concluding simile of houses built on rock or stand, 
sand, one finds Jesus curing the son of a Roman centurion who has more faith than anyone in Israel. For the author of Logoi, Moses slays, Jesus saves. Later, John the Baptist sends disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one to come? That is the promised prophet like Moses, or are we to expect someone else? Jesus then lists the miracles he had performed as proof that he is indeed the coming one like Moses, who was predicted in Deuteronomy to perform wonders. He then turns to the crowds and praises John as the greatest person ever born, quote, yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. In other words, even though John is inferior to the least significant of Jesus's followers, he's greater than everyone else, including, of course, Moses. Jesus's radical behavior prompted some to accuse him of being a chum of tax collectors and sinners. It is here that Logoi probably narrated the story of Jesus forgiving a sinful woman. The famous story of the woman taken in adultery in the Gospel of John, I'm sure, came from the Q document. And you won't find that in any other scholar's work. Jesus' instructions for the mission after his death contrast sharply with Moses' instructions to Israel before their conquest of the Promised Land, as presented in Deuteronomy 20, where he commanded the 12 tribes to offer peace, but if the residents reject it, they must destroy them utterly. By contrast, Jesus tells the 12 that when they meet rejection, they must shake off the dust from their feet and move along. In the last recoverable log, logian from Logoi, Jesus promises the 12 that God will provide each a throne from which to judge one of the 12 tribes of Israel, that is, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, and quote. At the end of Deuteronomy, of course, Moses predicts victory over the residents of Canaan and the rule of judges over the 12 tribes. One more paragraph. Whereas previous reconstructions of Q contain many of these logia, or these sayings, they appear to be a haphazard collection of utterances with an occasional narrative. My reconstruction, on the other hand, is a coherent and sustained rewriting of Deuteronomy. Scholars of the Hebrew Bible will recognize this as rewritten scripture. Classicists might call it transvaluative mimesis. Now, some of these parallels are weaker than others. Uh, that's always the case when one compares two documents looking for imitation or similarities. Nonetheless, the uh, combined um, examples, references to Moses, the direct citation to Deuteronomy, leave little doubt that the author was interested in conveying that Jesus is the new prophet like Moses. So we've got another question. Um, Donnie Springer, thank you for the $20 PayPal donations. Is it? So, so um, I'm going to get it up on the screen here. Isn't it an easier expansion that there was a lost gospel that Mark redacted containing the doublets? One source, Markin, and the other, an older source that both Matthew and Luke used in addition to Mark. In other words, a source that all canonical gospels used as a source, but is now lost. Danny, that's exactly what I'm arguing. That um, Mark knew the Q document. So that uh, Mark knows the same source that Matthew and Luke used independently. And therefore, one cannot ignore Mark in uh, reconstructing the lost gospel. One has to take it as a freer and more tendentious uh, version. Uh, Matthew and Luke were more generous and uh, conservative with the Q document. But no, you're right that uh, Mark, now the Q document did not have the doublets. It had the version of the saying that became a doublet in Matthew and Luke. But your, your general insight is right on target. And uh, in the shipwreck the Gospels, you mentioned um, that Paul has about three cases 
of, of uh, in, in three different cases, he has attributed saying to Christ that it is similar to what it's found locally in the Q document. Are you therefore suggesting that Paul was aware of the Q document? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, although um, some scholars have toyed with the idea that, for example, the sending out of the disciples uh, in poverty to um, carry on the mission, an apocalyptic preaching mission in, in, is, in Paul is similar to what one finds in the Logo of Jesus. And in fact, it, it's very similar. But it's unlikely that um, they're appealing to, Paul's appealing to the Q document. It's likely that that actually was a widespread understanding in the church that the Q author and Paul agreed on. The same thing's true, uh, Jacob, with the saying that I mentioned earlier about the prohibition of divorce. Paul has a prohibition of divorce, but um, it likely doesn't come from the Q document. It probably comes from early Christians remembering or uh, creating the prohibition of divorce. Uh, and there are uh, several other places where one finds this overlapping content. But one place where I think it really is so important for understanding the historical Jesus is Paul and the Q document both insist that Jesus's career represents a realignment of understanding of the Torah. And both of them <clears throat> understand Jesus to have either been the end of the law for, um, for Paul or for the author of the Q document to say that the law and the prophets were until John. After that, it's the kingdom of God. And what Josephus has to say about the um, execution of Jesus's brother James squares with that. Uh, James and those who are executed at the stone with him um, are in the margins. They are both Torah observant and Torah disobservant. So, um, so there are interesting overlaps between Paul and the Q document, but I'm suspicious of anyone who would claim that there's a direct uh, literary connection, though there actually could be. How, how would you contrast your reconstruction of the Q document from other reconstructions besides it being longer because of your, uh, because of uh, you say that the Q document used Deuteronomy? I think there are um, some relocation differences. So, for example, in all other reconstructions of Q, the commission to the disciples to go on their mission appears in the middle. But I place it at the end um, for uh, some very complex reasons that I could go into. But that would be one major difference. Another one that I flagged when I was reading my summary is that I include the story of Jesus and the adulterous woman, which I think originally was simply a sinful woman. And that what Jesus was writing with his finger in the dirt is the very legislation that the elders are using to accuse this woman of a capital crime. But instead of writing it in stone, as God does in the Septuagint version of Deuteronomy, Jesus is writing it with his finger, just as God wrote with the finger in stone, but he's writing it in dirt to indicate that it's flexible. And uh, this is a case where um, the <laughs> Torah flexibility of the author becomes really into play, that the elders want to be Torah enforcers, and they're willing to um, kill this woman in order to, uh, to, to satisfy the Mosaic commandment. And Jesus says nothing doing and forgives her, even though she's not repentant. So that's another major difference. Um, th there are other differences as well. Um, the, the, usually the Q document does not include very many uh, controversy stories or narratives. And um, my reconstruction of Q has uh, quite a few extra um, controversies. <clears throat> 
how did scholars react uh, with uh, with your association of Deuteronomy with the Q document? I have not gotten a lot of um, feedback on it, honestly. I think oh. people are so entrenched in the synoptic problem between the far hypothesis that denies the Q, in which case Deuteronomy is useless, or the, uh, uh, the two-source hypothesis and the critical edition of Q that is the result of the International Q project, um, that they're just unwelcome to uh, another alternative. Um, and so it's been a frustration for me. But you know, to put it another way, I don't know if they are simply ignoring my work or they find nothing to challenge in the work. I'd like to think it's the latter, but uh, more likely uh, it's simply they're ignoring it because they're um, so confident of their own positions. Do you think that the 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 pape you talk about Papias uh, a bit because um that's you put Papias between Matthew and Luke and you think that Luke that's Acts right. used Papias and that part of Q plus Papias right. hypothesis. Right. Do you said that Papias mentions a Hebrew Gospel of Matthew? Yes. So my question is. Could it? Could that document have possibly have been written? Could the author of Matthew have been bilingual and he just wrote one version in Hebrew and the other in Greek, or is it two different authors? Um, there was never a Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, ever. Um, Papias is not uh, does not have access to it. Neither does his primary informant, the Elder John. They use a hypothetical Matthew to explain why the two Matthews they have in Greek differ from each other, and they differ from each other according to Papias, actually are already according to John the Elder, um, because of uh, incompetent Greek translators. So each did the best he could, but both of them botched up the Hebrew original, and Papias says that what he's trying to do is to restore Matthew's original sequence, his toxis, and to get things in the right sequence. And he does so by comparing the three Greek Gospels he knows, and he's conjecturing about what the right sequence would be. But he also um, has a material from a living voice and from his own experience, because he is the um, a bishop of Heriopolis, although there may not have been bishops in his time. He was a leader of the church in uh, Heriopolis, and in his congregation were some daughters of Philip who had narrated, or at least in his circle, had uh, narrated stories um, uh, from Christian antiquity. So uh, there never was a Hebrew uh, Matthew that was a uh, conjecture. In fact, this is fascinating, I think. People say that um, the Q document is conjecture, and it is, and, but so is the uh, Hebrew Matthew, but the conjectures are really quite different, and one can be justified and the other really can't be. So there never was a Hebrew Matthew. What do you make of Papias suggesting that a Christian called John compiled a Logoi? And he appears to be saying that he did this before Mark. Could that be the Q document? Well, he did say that Q is a non-Christian document, but uh, what do you think? Of it? You're going to have to say the question again, Jacob, because I'm, I'm not sure I understand it. Okay. Well, my question is, what do you make of Papias suggesting someone called John compiled a logoi before mark no he didn't uh, that's not okay. what he says okay um what uh, now the the, the the text we have in question uh with the two citations that are related most directly to the gospels both come from eusebius who's writing in the fourth century and he is not always uh reliable but in these these cases i think he is so that there's reason to 
to be more trusting. He says that in the case of Mark, um, uh, Mark did not follow Jesus himself. He followed Peter and he transcribed Peter's preaching and got the order mixed up because the preaching uh, wasn't concerned about sequence. He then says that Matthew wrote his own version in a Hebrew gospel and apparently I think the elder thinks he got the sequence right. But the two Greek translators botched it up because the same materials that are overlapping between the Q document and Matthew appear in a different sequence. So the lost gospel of Hebrew, uh, the, go the lost gospel of Matthew, that is an independent translation, in my view, was the Q document. And I think there are other uh, arguments for it. I can give them for it to you. But uh, that's the issue. Uh, John and Papias do not know a Hebrew gospel. Uh, John imagines there was one because some disciples should have gotten everything correct, but that gospel's lost. All he has is three Greek gospels, and both of them are doing the best they can to make sense of the order. Do you think that the Q document was originally written in Hebrew, or was it written in Greek? It had to be written in Greek. Okay. Because, uh, and here Deuteronomy helps, because the text that's being evoked is the text of the Septuagint Old Greek. It's, it's not Hebrew or, or Aramaic. But th that said, there are Aramaic loanwords strewn throughout the Logoi of Jesus. Some of them we don't think of as loanwords, perhaps. Gehenna is one. Mammon is another. Amen um, is another. Um, so the, the, the Aramaic is there, but it's uh, in transliter transliterated into Greek um, in this text. Um, when do you date Mark and Matthew? Because I know you date Luke and John into the second century. Um, but when do you think the other two Gospels are written? I think it's easy to um, understand the time span generally for the Gospel of Mark because it's written after the Jewish War and it's uh, the author is still devastated by the loss of life and the destruction of the Jerusalem church. And um, his anti-Roman sentiments occur uh, in and out of the, uh, the gospel. And he's the one who um, is the first literary text that survives where uh, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and, uh, and so on. So it, has, it cannot have been written soon after the war simply because such a complex document requires some time. So I would say it couldn't have been written before 72. But I also think it had to be written before 80 because then the, um, the, the devastating consequences of the war may not have been uh, felt so, uh, so badly. What the document, the, the uh, time span for Matthew then is obviously after Mark um, and probably uh, several years after Mark, so that Mark's uh, account would have had some traction. Um, so I would say it was probably in the 80, I put it around 85 or so. Then if we uh, deal with Papias again, Papias claims um, that um, it, would, it would suggest that um, John the Elder already knew of Matthew um, in the, at the end of the uh, first century. So Matthew had to be written um, uh, prior to 90, in my view. So these are time spans. They're flexible. They uh, interrelate. But um, Papias is writing around, uh, he published his uh, exposition of Logi about the Lord, probably about 110. And uh, Luke is somewhat later, and then the uh, three versions of the Gospel of John are later 
I'm curious, what what do you make of the Matthean posteriority hypothesis that Luke is before Matthew and, and that Matthew used Luke and Mark? It's nonsense. Hmm. It's nonsense. It, it doesn't square with the external evidence. It doesn't square with the internal evidence. Um, and one reason that people would want to say that, I suppose, is that Luke sometimes does have reverse priority to Matthew. So, uh, but I think it's just easier to say the reverse priority to Matthew comes from the Q document and not to say that he knows uh, that Matthew knows these things in Luke. I mean, the, that hypothesis really has no merit in my view. You say that Mark uses the Q document. So why do you think Mark didn't include the sayings of Christ that Matthew and Luke include? Did he just, well, was he just it, expanding? It, it, he includes a lot of them. He includes a lot of them. But he, he's not as concerned about Jewish law the same way that the, that the, that Matthew was and Luke to some extent afterwards. But um, the Q document is con consumed with this issue of Deuteronomy, Jesus as the prophet like Moses. Mark is interested in seeing Jesus as a new Odysseus, as a new Hector, as a, as a new um, Heracles. He's a, a Greek hero. He's not the new Moses in the same way. So you don't, uh, much of the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, that does not appear in Mark directly, appears someplace uh, elsewhere. About four examples appear elsewhere in the gospel uh, embedded in narratives. But he's not interested in Jesus as an alternative to, uh, pre uh, preacher of Deuteronomy. He simply has uh, a, a, a different agenda. And there's no reason for him to have to include everything in a source. Luke doesn't include everything in his sources. Final question. Um, do you think that Mark, Matthew, and Luke could have been using additional sources in a scenario similar to like the four document hypothesis put forward by Streeter? Uh, I don't see that one needs to do that because if you if you do, if I'm right about this, what you'd have to say is that these two or more documents that um, could have been around, say an M source or an L source, share social identity, they share vocabulary, they say share uh, an understanding of Christology, they share a certain understanding of Jewish law. And um, it's not impossible that they do share that, but there's no reason to assume that that sharing isn't uh, a part of a coherent document that's now lost and can be, I think, relatively reasonably reconstructed. Now, let me, let me say, Jacob, too, my reconstruction of the Q document or the logo of Jesus is not what came from the pen of the author. It's the best one can do with the criteria that we set forth. And um, apart from finding manuscripts of the document, the best we can do is educated conjecture. But honestly, I spent over two decades trying to work on this problem. And um, it hurts me a lot that people who admire my work on mimesis of uh, Greek poetry in the Gospels dismiss my concerns about the Q document simply because we don't have a physical fragment of it. Well, those who have studied classics know that uh, classicists frequently are working to reconstruct lost sources, um, to find um, the sources embedded in historical works so this is, this is not my interest in rewriting a gospel and projecting my own um, understanding in it. It, it comes out, it's a, it's a scientific enterprise. And by the way, um, <laughs> your, um, I, I like your channel about uh, History Valley and so hmm. on. It's a historical Thank enterprise. You. It's not a theological enterprise. Bob Kelly, thank you for the nine dollars ninety-nine cents. Why do you suppose Papias' expositions was not preserved? Seems like it would have been important to early Christians. Thank Bob, you, Bob. That's a great question, and I think 
Papies' exposition was not preserved for the same reason that the Q document wasn't preserved, except with one um, more stage. The Q document has Jesus making predictions about the future that never took place. It also is not sufficiently Christian. So uh, when the gospel authors rewrite it, they rewrite it in some cases with an explicit, what in Luke, uh, Pauline uh, theological agenda. Now, if Papias's comments at the beginning of his preface are correct, he's interested in integrating three gospels, that is uh, Mark and two Matthews, one of which is lost. Now, if that gospel is lost, his enterprise about trying to inter integrate all three of these um, texts is stupid. And that's basically what Eusebius says. He says, uh, anybody who reads this will know he's a man of very little intelligence. Well, the Papian fragments indicate that he's a man of remarkable intelligence. What makes it look stupid is he's trying to integrate three Gospels, only two of which exist, and, and the third one um, not only was uh, it was gone, but it wasn't part of the four gospel canon that Eusebius was concerned about. Um, so I think that's why it failed to uh, to survive. An excellent question, Bob. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining me once again, Professor McDonald. It's been a very very fun conversation. I thank everybody for donating Super Chats, PayPal. Um, helps keep this show going. Thank you, everybody. Create something beautiful. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.